My name is Wyndham Wilson, and this is, this is our first day of the IW NHL meeting. We've had a very good meeting today, and we've had a number of very exciting sessions. Uh, in particular, we just finished up a session looking at some of the new technologies using circulating tumor, tumor DNA. And I, I, I have my uh, speakers with me. And we would like to discuss some of the applications of this uh, very new uh, uh, um, test that can be done. Ash, you were the first person up. And uh, it was very exciting to hear about your new uh, um, uh, test using CAPC. Could you tell us a little bit about what, what CAPC is and how you could envision this being uh, used? Sure. Um, uh, CAPSeq is, uh, represents cancer personalized profiling by deep sequencing, but in a nutshell is capture-based sequencing. Um, this is uh, an idea for trying to capture the part of the cancer genome that might tell us about the therapies we might want to treat a patient with, um, with the idea that we have targetable mutations that might be exciting ways of selecting patients for therapy, determinants of risk, and mechanisms of resistance. Um, so I presented some data, as you know, for using this at various disease milestones, including ones we didn't think that we could um, practically use, but we're surprised to see some of the, the value in that. We heard a couple of uh, folks in the audience say, too good to be true. So we'll work on trying to convince folks for, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, um, these tests can, can actually be useful. One of the exciting things is that you will be identifying or can identify specific mutations. How do you go about deciding which ones you want to target? And because you have to a priori identify them, how do you know that you're not missing new ones that could be coming up as part of clonal uh, selection? Sure. Um, so when we have knowledge of the tumor and we genotype the tumor by looking at a biopsy, we can track those mutations and see how they change over time. But the same assay allows us to detect novel mechanisms of resistance agnostic to the mutations that were there before. Uh, we've had a successful story in this regard in applying the same method for lung cancer for determining mechanisms of resistance to a third generation kinase inhibitor. We've just started trying to do the same thing with lymphomas, um, but here the questions I think should relate to the best drugs <coughs> and the best milestones for looking at resistance. So um, I showed some examples of seeing resistance to ibrutinib. We've also done a little bit with italalacid, a little bit with lenalidomide, um, but uh, I think the um, opportunities are wide uh, for us to, to start learning about these drugs and mechanisms. So, Mike, where do you see this go, going? Do you see this as still being very, very early? Or can this be really the start of, of how we can go about doing more precision medicine in, uh, uh, in uh, lymphomas and perhaps specifically with uh, large cell lymphoma? Well, I think this work uh, from, from both groups uh, really is in, incredibly exciting because it allows us to start to get toward what you describe as personalized medicine. In, in other words, we have the ability now with our current therapies and the very exciting new treatments that are coming along to really get a, a good response and a remission in the majority of patients, uh, including especially with large cell lymphoma. But one of the questions is, uh, how, do we, how can we predict who's going to achieve a very deep and durable remission and potentially be cured? Who's likely to fail that therapy and therefore needs to shift directions to something uh, else? In the case of some lymphomas where we might use a maintenance therapy, it would be nice to spare those who are already in a deep and long-lasting remission the need to be coming in continually for treatment or to be continuing on a long-term oral therapy. So we've needed for a long time better tools to help guide individual patient management so we don't under or over treat them. And I'm 
I'm very enthused that the, the technology we're seeing now is going to be a, a very good pathway to, to get us to that goal. Mark, you did the, uh, I would say, the first study to ever look at uh, using VDJ, uh, gene rearrangement, uh, to look at the kinetics of response in large cell and also to predict re relapses. Can you uh, briefly tell us uh, how uh, about that study and what some of the major findings were? Sure, so the study we performed was um, based on <clears throat> a number of patients that had diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and I think it's important to recognize that that is a, a diagnosis that we cure most of the time. So um, it's one of the successes in combination chemotherapy. We cure the majority of patients with large cell, but what we don't know is how to improve the cure rate on those that aren't already going to be cured with standard therapies. So we asked um, a question of, you know, how do some of these newer tests, these are blood tests, in our case this was a test that was analyzing for gene sequences that code for the immunoglobulin receptor. What's important about that is most, if not all, cases of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma have a unique immunoglobulin receptor that can be followed over time, and so it becomes a sort of um, very specific marker of that individual patient's tumor, as it were. So we asked a question of, do these blood tests perform? How do, they, how do they perform compared to conventional ways of understanding patients that have relapsed? And those are mainly um, based on imaging scans. So what is typically happens after therapy is then patients are monitored with CAT scans. And we had a number of patients, um, in this case it was over 125 patients, um, that were followed with CAT scans. But they had blood tests at the same time they had the CAT scan. And what we observed after therapy was that the blood test was much more predictive of relapse or progression than CAT scans. So in other words, by the time our clinicians figured it out, a blood test, at least it looks like, would have been able to identify that earlier. In some cases, that earlier was a, a month. In some cases, it was up to three or even 12 months. So our study wasn't really designed to show that therapy given in that period of time would have made a difference, but it certainly opens the door. In addition to that, all of the patients, every time they came in for treatment, actually had a blood test taken. Um, and so we were able to ask the question of what happens to these, in this case it's you know DNA floating in the bloodstream, what happens to that in the middle of treatment? Is this something that um, can be used as a way to predict who is going to fail therapy while they're actually getting therapy. And we observed a couple of things that um, are probably relevant. Um, you know, Ash uh, saw similar things. One of them is that the DNA actually clears out of the bloodstream very quickly. In fact, if it's not gone after you've already done two cycles of therapy, then your chances of uh, that therapy failing you is quite high. Um, uh, conversely, if you have cleared it by two cycles of therapy, your chance of never having a progression is, is very good. So those were sort of principles that um, you know, we were able to observe. I think those are sort of foundational pieces that can be applied to other um, situations where we're trying to improve the cure rate of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It opens up some, some, some novel opportunities and potentially even to add additional technological advances like some of the things that ASH have been studied. They give a whole other layer of information that may add to what we already know about what we just saw. So, so one thing that I think is really useful is that looking at circulating tumor DNA, it's actually a quantitative test. And because of that, you can both correlate it with the amount of tumor burden using more uh, uh, typical ways of looking at tumor burden, be it by CT scans or LDH, et cetera. And also because it's quantitative, you can also look at it as a dynamic measure of a tumor response. And of course, we've tried to do that with clinical trials where we've tried to look at in the past the rapidity of a CT response in order to predict whether or not someone's going to do well. And those, those kinds of studies uh, haven't really worked very well in terms of using uh, that as a measure as to whether or not you want to use more aggressive therapy. What is uh, interesting is both your study, Ash, as well as your study, Mark, both of you <clears throat> showed that there was a quantitative uh, relationship between the circulating tumor DNA and the actual amount of tumor bulk. Can, can you, Ash, uh, give us a little more 
uh, in information on, 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 on what, what that looked like and also the work that you're doing looking at the quantitative reduction in actual uh, circulating tumor DNA as a measure of whether or not they were going to have a, a good long-term outlook. We started by looking at 12 patients that were treated using the epoch-based uh, regimen to try to look at how quickly DNA cleared and um, made some decisions around the easiest blood time points to collect. And we noticed that uh, even in a small group of 12 patients, the patients who ultimately responded had cleared um, at least 100-fold uh, the level of DNA. Um, and so we set that threshold. Now, unlike uh, uh, the study that Mark did, we used a different way of measuring the DNA. We are measuring it uh, in plasma and not serum. Uh, we're using multiple mutations as opposed to the immunoglobulin gene. So in this group, we didn't, the patients didn't actually become undetectable by that time. They had dropped 100-fold. And we took that number forward in a larger group of patients, and that number, the 100-fold drop um, by the second or third cycle, uh, actually is what we observed to predict ultimate radiographic response and progression-free and overall survival. Um, I think so the prognostic value of these tests for early response is quite um, clear, um, but and, and the numerical change seems to reflect the cell uh, the tumor burden reduction that we're getting with each um, cycle of therapy. If we we're a radiation biologist, we would actually measure those things and we would make decisions around the doses we give. but uh, we've been used to relatively dull tools and relatively dark, scenarios for assessing the response, waiting six cycles before assessing a pet. I think it's an opportune moment to try to change that um, in, um, in terms of how to overcome the issues that you mentioned with CAT scans and the rapidity of the drop. I, I, I think that we might have higher precision tools than CT scans in, in quantifying the response. Um, and I, I, but I think the, the question is how do we not repeat some of the, the prior um, challenges that uh, we ran into with pet-adapted therapies, randomized trials from Germany and Canada that have not borne fruit, and whether it's in large cell and also in Hodgkin's disease for dose, uh, for directing radiotherapy and um, um, dose escalation or de-escalation. I think those are the challenges. Mark, now maybe in a very short little uh, uh, um, review, I guess you also showed that, that, that you could look at the circulating tumor DNA and it could also be a dynamic measure of outcome? Yes, I mean, it's, it's clear from all the data available in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that the patients cleared the DNA quickly. Um, in fact, in some cases, patients after only one cycle of therapy will be completely undetectable by at least the measures of the VDJ. And we know they're not cured at that point. So I think what it becomes then is a in vivo assay of sensitivity to therapy, or at least that the biologic processes that this tumor is relying on are shut off to some degree. And so that's why it's useful. So Mike, uh, final word here. Do you, how do you um, feel about using a dynamic test like this? Does this appeal to you? because it actually will give you a read within a single, not even a single cycle, within really a few days of starting, of starting therapy. Uh, you could pre-treatment and perhaps, I don't, re I don't recall the time frames you were uh, using, but you could work out algorithms where you could get the, the uh, log change within two or three days. I mean, is, is it something that you could see as being a very useful tool? Uh, sure, I think I think knowing uh, as early as we can whether a treatment uh, course that we've initiated is going to be successful in curing that patient or not is, I mean, that's a holy grail that we really uh, have been looking for and we need. And I think the the discussion here reflects the enthusiasm that we now have sort of a, a readily available, accessible tool. Uh, uh, and a very sensitive one, yet very specific, which is a hard clinical assay to, to generate, but one that can really give us high predictive value for how a patient's going to do. On the other side, the, to me, sort of equally exciting to that aspect of the assays uh, 
uh, is that, that we can start to sample the tumor heterogeneity, which we have recognized for some time. If you sample multiple areas of the body that are involved by a lymphoma, the, the genotypic markers in those various areas aren't identical. And we know that perhaps there's a subpopulation that may be persistent through the initial therapy and lead to a recurrence. And this, uh, uh, this technology allows us to start to get at that and to recognize which subclone might be persisting and also to identify within that, coming back to your initial comments about personalized medicine, craft the next therapy uh, that is gonna have the highest chance, if, if we can, to putting it into remission and curing the patient. Well, I'd like to thank my, uh, my colleagues here. I think we've had a very exciting day and I particularly uh, enjoyed this uh, session because I think it really is at the, the cutting edge of using molecular tools to help us uh, craft therapy in a precision way. We hear precision medicine is the future and I actually believe that this kind of, these kinds of studies are, are going to be what is going to ultimately allow us to identify targetable lesions and, and lead to the practical use of uh, precision medicine. Thank you.